Okay, welcome to the broadcast. Okay, tonight I'm changing gears, switching gears a little bit to look at some domestic issues with nuclear. And before I get into that, I just quickly want to, on a positive note, mention that, you know, I see what seems to be forming and what I'm going to begin to call the underground media, not even the independent media because I don't even want to associate us with that. But there's a group forming, and it's not all Plumegate. Some of us are on different subjects, but by and large, we all agree on mostly everything, and we have very little differences. And it seems to me that, that they're projecting truth for free in a timely fashion, and this is only going to catch on as people realize, yes, you too can join us. You too can have a YouTube channel. You can have a blog talk radio show. It's free for 30 minutes a night to anyone. 30 minutes isn't that long to cover. Do a two-hour show and then try 30 minutes. It's gravy. So there's a lot of avenues to get the information out. We don't have to rely on the finance and moneyed uh, interests, the ones they control, and that's mainstream and alternative, and a couple of these independent guys are sketchy characters too. So on a positive note, what I see forming is this network of people who are really in it for only one thing, and that is getting the facts to the American public. Okay, that's it. That is our only goal. It ain't about making money. It's not about showmanship. It's not about being fancy schmancy. It's not about fluffing things up or taking it to the extreme or getting a lot of credit or being famous or your ego or anything. It's about changing the world and getting the message out there. And indeed, there is a group now, uh, kind of unofficially, I just see it beginning to form these little uh, underground uh, outlets, uh, mostly YouTube for now and some blog posts, but uh, really some blog sites. But really, there's some excellent work being done if you know where to look. And I want to hook you up with those people so I do reblog um, interesting and important uh, blogs from other sites. I've got a couple up on my, on my blog now. If you want to go take a look, I'm hosting two or three from other uh, WordPress blogs. They're very well written. Uh, one by Harold Saeed on the weather modification, climate modification ongoing, and the intensifying of these hurricanes they've been doing since the 60s and 70s and on. You know, it's a, such an excellent article. My mom read it and was just given high praise. And, and I told her to read it because it's just uh, in 40, 45 pages, it really sums up the entire history of weather modification. And it's, you know, Harold's not out to make money. It's a free WordPress blog, and he, he volunteers and does all the work himself, you know. So, so there's some positive changes coming about. You know, I can see in the future if things begin to snowball and continue in this direction, you know, one day they're going to have to shut the Internet down. But maybe it doesn't get that far. Maybe it does. But on a positive note, there seems to be some, real people that I've been able to find that are genuinely concerned with doing the right thing. Okay, so tonight we're going to, let me bring up my screen captures. I have a link as well on the uh, my blog radio post. You can follow along with the screen captures on Uncovering Plumegate, a WordPress blog that myself and 2012 Truthers are working with together. And let's dig right in. What we're looking at tonight is a report to Congress in 2012, February of 2012, to Congress from the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. And that's the first screen capture I have is just from the cover page. And it says, above all, the board must have a primary mission to identify the nature and consequences of any significant potential threats to public health and safety to elevate such issues to the highest levels of authority and to inform the public. And first, we're going to talk a little bit about what their mission is and what the DNFSB really does. And they call themselves the last line of defense, you know, checking on DOE, Department of Energy, and making sure. And this has to do specifically with facilities that either produce, like, uranium for weapons or treat the leftover waste products and deal with the leftovers. So my first couple screen captures just go in to inform you what basically this uh, board does. The, the third screen capture says, the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board is pleased to submit to Congress its 22nd annual report for calendar year 2011. So they have to report to Congress every so often, and this is their report for the calendar year 2011, and it's submitted in, the, in this year, 2012. Okay, on the next screen capture, 
the board statutory mission. Okay, I want to read all of this to you because I, I really, when I look at some of these, some of the structure in place already, we have some good things going on. Uh, I was at the Levy County hearing to see if they're going to put new plants in Levy County, and to a certain degree, I wasn't totally displeased with the investigation by the judges, the three panel judges there. They were they were asking some tough questions. I don't know if they're going to do any good. I don't know. But my point being, there's structures in place already. If we can just get enforcement, we can we can definitely raise the level of safety. I'll put it that way. We just need enforcement of what's already in place and the recommendations that have been made, not only by this particular board here, but the NTTF, the Near Term Task Force, that went over to Fukushima, and they also submitted, I believe, to the NRC, if I'm not mistaken, a report on their recommendations for plants over here based on findings at Fukushima. Okay, so there's structure in place now. We just need to make it work, and we can definitely improve safety in, in our, domestically in our plants here in this country in any case. The 1970s and 1980s were turbulent decades for the nuclear industry worldwide. In 1975, a serious fire at the Browns Ferry Nuclear Power Station nearly led to a core melt accident. Such an accident did take place four years later at the Three Mile Island Power Reactor site in Pennsylvania. These two watershed events caused the NRC to spend much of the 1980s seeking to impose new safety requirements on both operating reactors and reactors under construction. By 1986, much progress had been made, and the nuclear industry was, quote, unquote, settling down. Then in April of that year, the Soviet-built Chernobyl nuclear reactor in Ukraine exploded causing the largest accidental release of radioactive material in history. While safety experts agreed that U.S.-built power reactors did not share the flawed Chernobyl design, there was some concern with graphite-moderated reactors operated by the U.S. Department of Energy. Broader studies of DOE's defense reactors revealed that safety improvements lagged far behind those being made in the commercial nuclear industry. Congress was also concerned about the slow pace of cleaning up the waste generated by decades of nuclear weapons production. Beginning in 1987, Congress began to consider legislation imposing some kind of external oversight or regulation of DOE's nuclear operations. Following two years of work by House and Senate committees, a compromise bill emerged based largely on Senator John Glenn's original bill, S-1085, Nuclear Protections and Safety Act of 1987. On September 28, 1988, President Reagan signed this bill into law as part of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 1989. The provisions relating to the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board were later codified in the Atomic Energy Act of 1954 as amended at blah, 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 so on and so forth. So that gives you a little background as to the history and basically the, the Senate bill by uh, Senator John Glenn, 1085, that really brought this board into creation and gave them certain powers. The board's essential mission is to advise the Secretary of Energy on measures needed to ensure the safety of DOE's quote-unquote defense nuclear facilities, a term defined in the Atomic Energy Act of 1954. This advice generally relates to preventing accidents affecting the public, workers, or both. Advice may be offered in a variety of ways, from informal exchanges between technical professionals to formal recommendations made on the public record to the Secretary of Energy. Safety measures may pertain to specific DOE facilities and activities or may be directed at the safety requirements and guides employed to regulate nuclear activities. Perhaps the most cogent summary of the Board's mission is that made by the Senate Committee on Armed Services in 1987, quote, Above all, the board must have a primary mission to identify the nature and consequences of any significant potential threats to public health and safety, to elevate such issues to the highest levels of authority, and to inform the public. So right there you see what they're supposed to do is look, see, and call them out, and inform and let everybody know. Again, I say these stru structures, do they ultimately make broad sh sweeping changes? Not necessarily. They can recommend, uh, they can point out things, and they can even legislate to some extent, I believe, but, it, but are they going through, falling through with that? And what we'll see tonight is there's a lot of foot dragging, if that's what you want to call it, and noncompliance and 
downplaying of particular numbers when they're when they're running equations to check for earthquake parameters or whatever it is. We'll, we'll go through this tonight. But you, there's just a lack of response on their positive response on their behalf. It's clear in this by this board's information here. That's pretty clear to me anyway. As noted above, the board's jurisdiction covers DOE's quote unquote defense nuclear facilities. The statute's definition is somewhat complex, but it can be understood in plain language. The board is only concerned with facilities operated by DOE that are one, covered by the Atomic Energy Act, and two, have a function related to national defense. The scope leaves out two major classes of government regulated nuclear facilities. DOE's nuclear projects that are civilian in purpose and commercial nuclear facilities regulated by the NRC. The board's oversight jurisdiction does not extend to the U.S. Navy's nuclear propulsion program, nor to environmental hazards regulated by the other federal and state agencies. The schematic figure on page 7 categorizes U.S. nuclear facilities, while the table below this figure lists the major sites that the board oversees. I have that screen captured in just a second, but I inserted another one from later in the in the report that talks about um, another aspect of what this board does under nuclear weapon operations. And this screen capture says the board is responsible for ensuring the safety of DOE's operations with nuclear weapons. These operations include making nuclear weapons components, taking apart retired weapons, disassembling active weapons for surveillance and maintenance and reassembling weapons for deployment by the armed forces. The board also provides safety oversight of the handling and storage of special nuclear material and tritium and the DOE's nuclear weapon research and development work. Again, tritium is a necessary component, and that does come from the nuclear power plants. Next screen capture. To carry out the mission outlined above, Congress granted the board an effective suit of statutory tools. Principle among these is the formal board recommendation issued to the secretary. The statute requires the secretary to either accept or reject the board's recommendation, and in the case of an acceptance, to write and execute an implementation plan. This process all takes place on the public record. In cases involving an, quote, imminent or severe threat, end quote, to the public health and safety, the statute requires the board to also send its recommendation to the president who makes the final decision on actions to be taken. In addition to recommendations, the board is empowered to hold public hearings and subpoena witnesses if necessary, conduct investigations, demand information and documents needed for the board's work, and review and comment on DOE requirements and standards affecting safety at defense nuclear facilities. DOE is required by law to grant the board quote, ready access to such facilities, personnel, and information as the board considers necessary to carry out its responsibilities, end quote. Finally, the statute empowers the board to seek assistance from other federal agencies, such as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and from organizations outside the government, such as the National Academy of Sciences, who I believe the National Academy of Sciences has the Chernobyl costs and consequences. They're, they have that. So that's a fairly reputable uh, of source National Academy of Sciences, and you can see in this little screen capture what what they can do, what this board can do. They have some investigative powers; they can get information, they can dig in and and find out what's going on. They're not totally helpless. Their arms are not tied behind their back. They have some ability, and and DOE has to or is supposed to cooperate with them to some degree. Again, you'll find tonight that there's a lot of dragging with DOE, and those contractors are. Uh, sometimes unscrupulous. The next screen capture is just a schematic graphic of where the uh, this board fits in and what they cover, which we just talked about, but it's basically relating to weapons. They don't really oversee the nuclear power plants. That's not what they're there for. Next screen capture, major site subject to board jurisdiction. I'll just read down some of these and I'm learning a lot of these myself on the fly as we go along. Hanford, I'm, I'm becoming, I've heard of it a number of times. Now I'm a lot more familiar with it than I have been previously. Hanford site is in Richland, Washington, and it's for cleanup and decommissioning. And there's a lot of strange stuff going on there with Bechtel, the um, contractor, this big corporation, Bechtel. There's, I'll tell you what, 
Well, there's like a, again, I say the, the integrity and you know honor and stuff seems to be just a lost thing in America these days in industry. It really, there's, I'm sure it still exists, but it's just to such a small degree that by and large, the, like I was telling my wife tonight, Greg Palace could write until he's 90 years old about these contractors and everything they're up to. It's just an incredible amount of of things going on if you're willing to dig in and look into it. Okay, Hanford side in Richmond, Washington. Idaho National Laboratory in Idaho, obviously. Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, that's 50 miles east of San Francisco, California. Los Alamos National Laboratory, where the fire swept through not too long ago. By the way, on the Bobby One Fatality Index projections, which he's an excellent source and very reliable, he also mentions the fires at Los Alamos recently and says once those fires happened, at that point, the fatalities that he's adding up uh, for the index study, he cannot attribute them solely to Fukushima. And then now he has to say, look, from Los Alamos, that kicked enough radiation into the atmosphere that people are going to die from that. That's a fact, and that's going to bump the death rate up even more. So he's factoring that in and saying, past a certain point, when the fire swept through Los Alamos National Laboratory, it ain't all related to Fukushima. Now we have another big source, that apparently, that was enough to actually have an impact over here as well. Okay, moving along. Nevada National Security Site, northwest of Las Vegas, Nevada. Let's see, operations. The disposition of damaged nuclear weapons, nuclear fission, and some critical experiments. Waste management is what goes on there. That's new one to me. Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Energy research, treatment, and disposal of radioactive waste. And that rings true. My dad took me there when I was a young teenager, I wasn't even 15, maybe 15, 14, 15, something like that. We rode up with some of his friends from the chemistry department in the U.S. to Oak Ridge National Laboratory. My father was originally in thin film detection, and then later he made an improvement on a device called a mass spectrometer, which I hear Chris Busby would like to get a hold of one. If you ever listen to my show, Chris, I'll tell you what, I am going to ask my dad to leave me his mass spectrometer, <laughs> okay? If I ever get a hold of it, I'll invite you out, and we'll figure out how to use this thing and start doing some sampling, okay? <laughs> okay, site. Pantex plant near Amarillo, Texas, maintenance of the U.S. nuclear stockpile. Sandia National Laboratories, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Nuclear research, support for weapons stockpile maintenance program. And as you know from some of my previous broadcasts, we discussed Sandia and some of their plume modeling for the NRC during the uh, worst of the Fukushima meltdowns. Savannah Riverside, Aiken, South Carolina. Tritium extraction, recycling and storage, management and treatment of radioactive waste, nuclear materials storage and disposition, research and development. Waste isolation pilot plant, 26 miles east of Carlsbad, New Mexico. Safe disposal of transuranic waste and underground repository, 26 miles from Carlsbad Caverns. Wow, that's unbelievable. Y-12 National Security Complex, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Manufacturing and surveillance of nuclear weapons components. Processing of weapons-grade uranium. Okay, so you get a little insight there into other sources of possible nuclear incidents, accidents, discharges, radiation emissions, that kind of stuff from here domestically. It's not just the nuclear power plants, but there's also the spent fuel pools we're worried about the what NRC nicely refers to as a byproduct. It's really a waste is what it is. You know, the, Your exhaust fume out of your car is not a byproduct. It's a waste, and we know that. And there's no easy solution where you can they do a process called vitrification, which kind of stabilizes some of the radioactive waste so you can store it better, but it's still around for thousands and thousands of years. And think of the contracts to maintain the dry cast storage. Where's the incentive to get rid of radioactive waste? Well, now the dry cast storage lobby is now knocking on the door of every country. See how fascism works. I won't get distracted. I promised Shazam that I wouldn't do that, and I'm not. Okay, the next screen capture. Highest priority safety problems. Earthquake hazard at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Remember, the fires just swept through there recently. A severe accident at the plutonium facility, and they call this PF4, at Los Alamos National Laboratory would present a significant risk to the public and is therefore one of the board's greatest safety concerns. On October 26, 2009, the board issued recommendation 
2009-DO, Los Alamos National Laboratory Plutonium Facility Seismic Safety, which recommended actions to protect the public from the consequences of a large earthquake and subsequent large fire at PF4. The board followed up by issuing recommendation 2010-1, safety analysis requirements for defining adequate protection for the public and the workers to address DOE's interpretation of its nuclear safety management rule and the associated DOE standard for preparing documented safety analysis. The rule and the standard form the underpinnings for ensuring adequate protection of the public at DOE's defense nuclear facilities. The standard establishes a 25 rem evaluation guideline for offsite exposure. If conservatively calculated, accident consequences approach the evaluation guideline. Safety controls are required to achieve adequate protection of the public by reducing off-site exposure. The board was concerned that managers at the National Nuclear Security Administration, and okay, that's NNSA, and I've, I've got a, I'm going to crank up a list soon of definitions and acronyms on uncovering uh, Plume Gate blog. I'm close to doing that. I'll, tomorrow or the day after, we'll have that up. NNSA, the National Nuclear Security Administration had approved the 2008 documented safety analysis for PF4 as compliant with the rule and the standard when the postulated accident consequences were two orders of magnitude greater than the evaluation guideline and three orders of magnitude greater than what might be considered an acceptable consequence. Okay, so their, their, their calculations are less than, than what this board considers realistic. Let me phrase it that way. And that's very dangerous when, when you're downplaying or underplaying certain calculations. Yeah, it's not a big safety risk. Don't worry about it. Hey, I wonder if they said that at Fukushima about a tsunami and earthquake there. In response, NNSA took immediate actions to reduce the material at risk, combustible materials and ignition sources. NNSA also completed analysis confirming that a large earthquake will likely damage the PF4 structure and many of its safety systems. As a result, NNSA reinforced several structural element, elements, including the roof. The board's ongoing review of NNSA's analysis has identified additional structural concerns that NNSA is still working to resolve. The board held a public hearing in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Mike mentioned that they often do that. They do public hearings. You can write a, a written letter to them, or and sometimes you're allowed to make a oral statement before the board, as was with the first uh, meeting, or maybe not the first, but the first one that I became aware of that my mom actually went to, which was in Crystal River. At that particular meeting, you could speak up as a member of the public. You were limited to what you could speak about. It had to be about environmental issues pertaining to the building of the plant, but you were actually allowed to make a statement. And on the fly, my mom was able to talk about the aquifer. She had a little bit of knowledge on that. So she wasn't totally handicapped there, although we found out that you just couldn't go in there and start raging on Fukushima and the effluents and all this other, the instability, the Mark I containment. In nothing logical can you actually approach them. With nothing that's a lock that we really got them on, you can't even mention that. Okay. Now, the board is holding public hearing in Santa Fe, New Mexico, on November 17, 2011, to discuss NNSA's plan to mitigate the remaining risks. Further analysis to determine whether the current structure of the facility can survive an earthquake must be completed. The board is not satisfied with the slow schedule for upgrading critical safety systems to survive an earthquake, particularly the ventilation system relied on to contain radioactive material released inside the building. The board continues to insist that NNSA clearly define, quote, unquote, adequate protection for the public and the workers and show how PF4 will provide such protection in the future. Again, you're going to hear me use this term foot dragging a lot, and that's what we've got going on here. And to the point of like, hey, we need to really define adequate protection because what, because what you think adequate protection is and what we think it is are two different things. Now we're arguing words here, which is really sad because we're, this isn't, like I say, solar power. This is nuclear power. It's a difference between a car and an airplane. If there's a problem with a car, coast off the side of the road. No big deal. Call your friend. Pick you up. Get a ride. And an airplane, when an engine goes out, hey, you land that thing as soon as possible. It's darn serious. If two of them go out, you crash and everybody's killed. And that's a fair analogy and fair comparison. So the board is not satisfied with the slow schedule for upgrading critical, critical safety systems. 
Oh, man. Wow. And this is consistent throughout this report, throughout this report. And the NTPF, the Near Term Task Force, their recommendations, there's a lot of good recommendations in there. The more serious ones, they're in no hurry to make come about. The easy ones that cost nothing, they can just write up procedures and retrain people. That's what they tend to want to do. That's what I get out of this anyway. Okay, safety implications of facility design changes. Safety issues have arisen at DOE's major design and construction projects as a result of DOE and its contractors altering safety-related aspects of the design without sufficient basis. The most prominent examples involve the Hanford Waste Treatment and Immobilization Plant and the Uranium Processing Facility at the Y-12 National Security Complex. Altering safety aspects of the design without adequately understanding the associated technical difficulties, complexities, or project risks involved can reduce the safety margin of the design, create new safety issues, and imperil the success of the project. Furthermore, maintaining consistency between the design and the safety analysis is the most efficient and cost-effective approach. In a properly managed nuclear project and consistent with DOE's own requirements, Safety features of the design should be decided upon during conceptual design and revised later only when there is a solid technical basis justifying the change. So what we see here is really staggering to me. I mean, for me, it's absolutely, if you were to tell me down at the solar uh, panel power plant, people weren't really, you know, doing what they're supposed to do as far as, in this case, they're altering safety-related aspects. It's like they're tampering, they're changing, they're making modifications. What are you guys doing? Are you an engineer? Are you a nuclear expert? Did you design the plan? Are you qualified to make? Are you making a safety-related, altering a safety-related aspect of the design on your own? Who are you informing of this? Do you just take a crew down and start making adjustments somewhere? So what we see here is they're fooling around with particulars of the plant. They have no business. They have no business. They're not qualified for that. An expert would come in, and I've heard some of these hearings where the experts testify. They, if anyone knows what they're talking about, and maybe they're overpaid, I don't know, but they certainly can talk on and on and on and seem to know what they're talking about. So these are the ones you want to have come in, look at the safety issue, and make a necessary adjustment after thoroughly looking it over with the mathematicians, engineers, the physicists, everybody get together and say, okay, we need to make a calculated adjustment here. Let's change something. You don't have your workers down there say, hey, let's, let's take this valve out over here. It's you know, that seems to be what we're getting out of, that's what I'm comprehending out of this in, in any case. So it seems to be a whole lot of, it's a, it's a lot of loose cannons running around there. And this is nuclear power again. We're not talking solar power or wind power. Robust oversight, both by line management and independent oversight organizations, is fundamental to assuring safety at defense nuclear facilities. The board remains the last line of defense to ensure DOE line management implements safety requirements needed to prevent accidents. So this board is, we didn't have this board, wow, where would we be right now? That's, I have to ask myself that. In pursuit of more efficient operations, DOE is undertaking initiatives to, one, create and test new governance models that rely more heavily on line organizations for safety oversight, and two, eliminate or streamline complex-wide directives and contractual requirements. That's just a little bit of fancy schmancy talk. If they were going to tighten things up, boys, don't worry. We're tightening things up down here. Both of these initiatives make greater demands on the board to provide effective independent oversight. And what they're doing is not helping the board to provide effective independent oversight. Eliminate or streamline complex wide directives and contractual requirements. Wow. In 2011, DOE made significant changes to its directive system governing construction, operations, maintenance, and decommissioning of defense nuclear facilities. By year's end, 49 directives have been canceled, and 52 more were revisited or recertified. The board reviewed every change made to each safety-related directive, and in many instances strongly advised against changes that weakened essential safety requirements. The OE retained the majority of the safety requirements in the directive systems. However, some requirements were removed or weakened over the board's objections. In other instances, the board's input enable DOE to strengthen key directives for startup of nuclear facilities and quality assurance programs. So in some instances, they are actually strengthening particular directives to, keep, to make things safe, 
but overall they're changing and doing things that the board is strongly advising against. It's weakening essential safety requirements. And we're talking nuclear here, folks. There's no room for error, no room for error. The next phase of this directive's overhaul is implementation of the revised directives. The board continues to question, as it did during its May 25, 2011 public hearing, whether DOE can assure that the modified directives are adequate to maintain nuclear safety. The board will closely monitor implementation of the field. So they're saying we're questioning that your new modified directives are going to be adequate. And they're streamlining. What are they doing? Getting rid of people? You know, you need extra help. And, and in this case, if nuclear power is so prolific of, a, uh, of making money, they should be able to easily pay for the added personnel that they need to run smoothly. But what we see is it's heavily subsidized. It's not profitable at all. It's a major loss to run these plants in so many ways. So the cancer industry is not complaining, not at all, not at all. But the taxpayers certainly are. Maintaining adequate safety controls. The board has intervened in a series of cases where DOE and NNSA sought to use less conservative accident calculations to downgrade engineered safety systems. This, to me, is incredible. When I read this stuff, I mean, I made so many comments to my wife, like I'm just putting my hand on my head and say, I can't believe it. And I, I you know, again, like I say, I'm naive coming into nuclear power. I, even though my dad's a nuclear physicist, I know absolutely zilch. So then when I begin to look into it, not just into the, the physics of it, but into the operations of the industry, the nuclear power industry, the weapons industry, all this is it's just the most shady, uh, slipshod-run organization I've ever seen. They don't seem to be that concerned about something that when you look at Fukushima and Three Mile and Chernobyl, Semi Valley, look at any of these reactors where we've had criticalities. Well, folks, it's, it never goes good, and they don't seem to be taking it very seriously is my point being. You would think that it would, they would run it with a military-type precision, you know, where people are really held accountable and, and if you do, if you're not keeping safety up to standards, you you know you're punished for it. And there's a openness of, of, of them wanting you to, hey, we we want you to come find anything, something, find us anything. We want to make sure everything's up to spec. So when we're when they send a, a team in to, to uh, an, analyze it, that everything comes up good, right? That's, I would go overboard with it if anything. The standard dictates that engineered structure systems and components are to be preferred over reliance on administrative controls. Engineered structure systems and components over administrative controls. In other words, they'd rather have a valve or a mechanical device that would uh, a, a circuit would come on and it would operate as opposed to relying on a human because humans are extremely fallible, right? That's for sure when it comes to nuclear power. Such preference is based on the uncertainty of human performance. There you go. The board sent DOE several letters in 2010 and 2011 pointing out and seeking the technical basis for improper changes in safety, philosophy, and analysis. Examples of such changes include at the Tritium facility at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, the contractor proposed removing the credited safety function of a glove box that confines radioactive gases and relying instead on an alarm to alert workers that tritium gas has been released. We'll talk more about this glove box thing. I'm still trying to figure out exactly what it is, but it's it's mounted, it seems like it's mounted up on a pole or something, and, it, and the components inside are at a very high temperature. If in an earthquake the glove box were to fall over, what I've been reading is it could spark or begin a fire. And that was one of the recommendations to have a look at these glove boxes to make sure that they're, they're secure enough to withstand an earthquake. At the Y-12 National Security Complex, NNSA approved removing the analysis of chemical and toxicological hazards from the safety basis for the highly enriched uranium materials facility and then directed the contractor to evaluate downgrading some or all fire safety measures credited in the safety analysis including the secondary confinement system. The safety design strategy for the uranium processing facility, currently in design, likewise excluded toxicological hazards from the safety analysis. At the Hanford Tank Farms, DOE approved downgrading the safety importance of ventilation systems that limit the accumulation of flammable gas and thereby help to prevent explosions in the high-level waste tanks. 
at the Savannah River site's tritium facilities, NNSA approved downgrading engineered safety controls that would prevent large releases of tritium. The safety basis was revised to specify mitigative and administrative controls, such as requiring workers in the vicinity of the facilities to take shelter until the plume of tritium release in an accident leaves the area. Again, another reference to plume. Uh, plume, plume, plume. They know all about the plume. The board is closely monitoring DOE's current effort to revise DOE standard 3009 to ensure that it continues to specify the correct hierarchy of safety controls. The board sees many of DOE's actions as a reduction of defense in depth, which should instead be strengthened in light of lessons learned from the Fukushima reactor accident in Japan and the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Probably worth reading one more time to you. The board sees many of DOE's actions as a reduction of defense in debt, which should instead be strengthened in light of lessons learned from the Fukushima reactor accident in Japan and the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. At some point, folks, you realize this fascist government regime of ours, if there's lessons, they don't learn them, and they don't care, and the lives are lost they do not care about. The profit margin, they certainly do and having a huge arsenal of these weapons to extort the entire globe with. I mean, obviously, that's pretty important as well. Okay, next screen capture, storage and disposal of nuclear materials. Again, there's so many different aspects to the nuclear industry. It's more than just the nuclear power plant. It's no, more than just the bombs. It's more than the waste disposal. It's the whole thing together. And then how does nuclear fit into the larger picture? Why are there planes spraying the skies of Florida every day? Right? Why are they using electromagnetic engineering to melt the polar caps? Why have they been doing that for 30 years and trying to stay climate change? And why is Arne Gunderson extolling nuclear power as a solution to climate change? And we all know now, if you're willing to research, climate change is simply climate modification. It's, it, they're doing it on purpose with the, with the spray planes. Right? In the 1970s, they knew that spraying the air with metallic particles would cause greenhouse effect and warming. And many years ago, it was a big thing. Everyone talked about melting the polar caps and getting the natural gas and the oil. But now, they say, it's, you know, it's, it's global warming, climate change, and, and the story's totally changed. But the planes are still spraying, and the harp system's still, you know, cranked up. That's a fact. So again, how does it all fit in? Well, trust me, nuclear power, if it's not the heart, it's at the core. It's pretty close to the pulse, to the heartbeat of this whole giant global fascist system. It's really a giant, big player, no doubt about it. DOE faces several challenges pertaining to defense-related nuclear waste and surplus nuclear materials. These materials exist in many chemical and physical forms, including large inventories of plutonium, uranium used nuclear fuel, and other highly radioactive isotopes. More materials are being added to these inventories as DOE ends Cold War era programs, decommissions old nuclear facilities, and uncovers or produces additional waste during site cleanup work. Now, Romney says it's clean energy. I mean, what was this phrase the other night? It's around the debates. Oh, my gosh. Romney, what, does, what planet does he spend most of his time on? Because on planet Earth, we have a nuclear freaking crisis around the globe, right? Fukushima, people don't understand. I mean, this is amazing to me when I read this stuff, that I look at our politicians and our captains of industry and our elected leaders, and they speak not of this. They absolutely, they dare not speak of it, but it's unfortunately a darn serious reality. We actually have thousands of fatalities related to Fukushima. They did the plume promise, and they're going on as if we're going to learn from Fukushima. Look, I'm telling you folks this. The learning curve they're on, we're all going to die. We're all going to die, and our kids are going to be horribly mutated. I mean, I'm hearing about kids being born on the West Coast without arms, people's teeth having problems, bleeding rectally, hair falling out. And this was early on with the, the um, or what do they call them on the airplanes, the stewardesses, they, were, they tried to blame it on the uniforms. Alexander Higgins had an article on it. At the same time, they said the polar bears were getting sick, hair falling out. No, 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 it's a disease. It's a di there's always an excuse, but it's not. It's nuclear. It's these massive releases when there's a criticality. And you can hear Chuck Castor refer to the NUREG and say, well, when there's a station blackout, there's going to be a breach of containment. Well, what does a breach of containment mean? It's not, it doesn't mean anything good, I can assure you of that. It's not releasing flowers and bunny rabbits coming out of crack on the side of the containment. 
Okay, it's a, it's a americanium and cesium and iodine and plutonium if it's a MOX reactor, as number three was in Fukushima. So this is insane when I read these reports. The DOE has been told everything they've needed to know for ten, since the, this board was in, in existence. They've been on them, getting on to them. What comes of it? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing substantial. Nothing substantial. Or why do kids have strontium in their teeth the closer you get to a nuclear power plant in America? I ask you that question. Somebody's explained that to me. And not someone from any eye that can't seem to use logic or common sense to solve a problem and come to a rational, logical, unbiased conclusion. Of course, I'm not paid to think otherwise. I don't, I'm not like the guy they found who was trolling it up. Here's a nice story for you from a source of mine. The guy was trolling up in these threads and when they followed him back and researched him and found out where he came from, as the story goes, he works overseas at a place that makes zirconium cladding for the fuel rods. In his spare time, the guy is online trolling for nuclear power. He's probably not even paid. He's just covering his job. He, he probably makes, a, I don't know, 100000 a couple of thousand a year. I don't know. That's pretty technical work. It has to be absolutely flawlessly done. When you do the zirk cladding, you can't have a crack. You can't have anything wrong. It has to be 100% perfect every time or you insert the rod and there's an immediate problem, right? That seems to make sense to me. So there's a little story for you. That's how bad it is, folks. I can read from these documents forever and ever and ever, but someone has to begin to paint this big picture like a lot of people won't do. They'll talk about one small thing or one small thing, but it's a giant big picture, it's, and everything is connected, and, and we are really in a bad way. I give you a little positive thought at the beginning of this because people are beginning to wake up and understand they're controlling our media. They're controlling our information, all aspects of it. And we, how difficult it is for us, we find, to get the word out about Plume Gate, about the NRC FOIA documents, about the situation with nuclear power and how critical it is right now. It is the single most important issue on the face of the earth right now and for some time to come. For many years to come, your children will be dealing with this problem. Their children will be dealing with these dry casts. For many years, making sure they're not cracked, making sure in an earthquake they don't move four to five inches like they did at the one place and get cracks on them. Right? This is a standard because Earth is still moving and changing. It's not a, it's a, it's a dynamic. It's not a static system. So, folks, to me, it's, it's madness. It is absolute madness. I'm going to continue to harp on this point. I will continue to push this point and try to express the big picture that we, if, you know, if someone looks at you and says, well, we're going to learn from these lessons, and you're right, we've got to do this and this. No, 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 that's not it. That's not it at all. So you're a shield for nuclear. You're a shield for the government. You're a shield for fascism. Because when you look at nuclear power, unless you're paid, unless you're paid to think otherwise, you can only draw one conclusion. My friends, there's only one conclusion you can draw. But it's like the Constitution of the United States of America, right? If I want to have a team of 1,000 lawyers and I pay them 250000 500000 a year, to, for them to interpret the Constitution, well, what does life and liberty and pursuit of happiness mean to 10,000 lawyers locked away in a room when they know they got a fat paycheck in it and they know what the boss wants? But the way you read the Constitution, the first time you or I read it, that's what it means. It doesn't mean anything else. It, it was written in simplistic format for us to easily understand it. But again, I say, if you look at the nuclear shills and trolls and apologists, they are paid to lie. They're paid to deceive, to stretch the truth, to distort the truth. You must understand this. Three main challenges exist. Number one, DOE must provide safe interim storage for these materials. Two, DOE must develop timely disposition plans to limit the risk to workers and the public. And three, DOE must identify the facilities and infrastructure needed to complete the disposition mission. That's what the board wants to know. They just don't want you to tell them, yeah, 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 we're going to handle it. They want to know specifically. But again, I will put it to you that on, on the whole, in the long run, what happens? Man, not a lot. Who's going to jail? Nobody I've ever heard of. Who's being punished for breaking the rules? Good luck on that. On February 28, 2011, the board sent a letter to DOE expressing concerns about the potential premature shutdown of the nation's only large-scale radiochemical processing facility, the Savannah River site H Canyon. That's the letter H-Canyon, H Canyon. Shutting it down could have significant unintended safety consequences due to the orphaning of unprocessed materials. Now, we'll come back to this term, orphaning. But it seems to me it's a nice way of saying that this radioactive material that you are unable to process, you don't have a plan or you're not handling it, whatever the case may be, 
is being mixed up and moved around and eventually may find its way into a scrapyard, a metal scrapyard. I, I may have this in the screen capture here, but I read a segment in here that I believe the case was in France. It was a big incident. Of course, we never heard of it over here in the United States because the media control is incredible, incredible. But over in France, there's a, a big stink about this metal um, recycling facility where apparently a, a piece of metallic cesium got into the, the metal as it went through the processing, and the whole plant got contaminated. It was high enough beckles the plant was contaminated. I, I, I believe it was shut down, if I'm not mistaken. It may still be to this day, but it was a big international stink. Again, I say on the American media, nothing on mainstream about it or probably much an alternative, anything at all. But nevertheless, it's very real, and that's what orphaning is. And if we don't do something with this radioactive waste, you know, nicely referred to by the NRC as a byproduct, it's a waste because it comes out of the plant, and there it is. There it is for thousands of years. We don't, can't turn it into gold. And we can vitrify it and help store it for a long period of time. But again, the problem with nuclear is one of the major problems is the waste. The spent fuel pool is accumulating. Robert Alvarez has an excellent study on that. I show you in the NRC for you documents where the White House asked for, requested a report on the dry cast storage situation. And they were given that. They were given that by, I believe, it was the NRC. So the White House is all too aware of the critical nature, again, it's not going to Yucca Mountain, but it is accumulating and piling up all around the country, not just the nuclear power plants, but at these facilities as well. And I might add, there are a number of research reactors around the country. There's one right here in the University of Florida. Actually, my dad, when he was still working up there, may to this day still have it's a palm, palm print access on their security, is my understanding. I haven't seen it, but I've heard him speak of it, where you press your palm up to the thing and it reads your whole pump you to get into this area where the research reactor is. I'm not even sure if it's still operating up here, if it's in cold shutdown or not. But we do have one here at the University of Florida. OK, so the orphaning of unprocessed materials, not good. During the board's public hearing at the Savannah Riverside on June 17, 2011, Department of Energy committed to develop a resumption hearing at the Savannah Riverside on June 17, develop a res a resumption plan, I'm sorry, resumption plan for H Canyon. Later in 2011, DOE directed the facilities contractor to use H Canyon and the associated HB line facility to process up to 3.7 metric tons of plutonium materials. So it's really serious materials they're working with there, even plutonium. DOE also directed its contractor to prepare to process sodium reactor experiment fuel one of the least stable forms currently in storage in Savannah River's L Basin. However, DOE has still not made any decision regarding processing the remaining spent fuel inventory at the Savannah River site. So again, I say foot dragging. They're not taking it very seriously. This is radioactive material. If you, if you look at the Chernobyl babies, if you know anyone with cancer, and cancer is on the rise, it's incredible right now, the people I'm hearing with cancer. It's just If you don't know someone with cancer, well, you're the exception. I'll put it that way. And it's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. I know people personally, and that's why I do this for free, and I come on here, and I'm not going to stop until my last breath to expose these bastards for doing what they're doing. And let me assure you, the American cancer industry, they ain't complaining. They have millions of dollars stored that they won't use. They've got people walking in circles wearing pink for crying out loud. And there's cancer cures out there now. Rick Simpson's ca uh, cannabis oil seems to be doing the trick in some particular cases. Why are we not exploiting these alternative cures? Again, Fascism, it's a big business. They're all connected. Nuclear, the cancer business, the war on terror business, all connected folks. Recommendations to the Secretary in 2011. On June 9th, 2011, the Board transmitted Recommendation 2011-1, Safety Culture at the Waste Treatment and Immobilization Plant, to the Secretary. The full text of the recommendation is reprinted in the appendix. I might even go back over that later if I screen capture from it. The board initiated an investigation into the safety culture of the Hanford Waste Treatment and Immobilization Plant project upon receipt of a letter dated July 16, 2010, from Dr. Walter Thomas Sidus. Folks, the strange and curious case of Dr. Thomas Sidus. It sounds like an H.P. Lovecraft book, for crying out loud. And it's strange. It really is. Let's talk about this guy, and later on we'll get into more detail on it. 
Okay, Dr. Walter Thomas Side is a technical professional employed at this project. While the investigation into Dr. Thomas Sidis, and if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, sir, I do apologize. While the investigation into Dr. Thomas Sidis' allegations was underway, the board conducted a public hearing with DOE and its principal contractors in Kennewick, Washington, to explore certain design issues. During the public hearing, the board came upon information suggesting that DOE and contractor management improperly restricted technical views expressed in testimony. They improperly restricted technical views expressed in testimony. It's kind of like in my Levy County hearing, and they're improperly restricting some guy's view, some testimony he's going to give on the stand. Based on this information, I'm continuing along, based on this information, the board extended the ongoing investigation into a second phase focused on testimony at the public hearing. Meanwhile, the board continued to investigate Dr. Thomas Sidis' allegations, and we're going to get more into what they ended up doing to Dr. Thomas Sidis, and it was really he got a raw deal, a raw deal for someone just trying to do the right thing. Again, they say whistleblower this and whistleblower that, and you can make all the little laws and all the executive orders of whistleblowers, but they're not really protected in this country, are they? They're not really protected. Whistleblower is given extremely harsh treatment. They say they're going to help them out and do everything for them, and yeah, 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 we appreciate you guys for shining the light on this you know, hidden secret bad stuff going on, but in the end they don't. They don't. Following a series of interviews and closed hearings held in the first quarter of 2011, the board reviewed evidence collected and concluded that prompt action needed to be taken by the secretary. The board therefore issued recommendation 2011-1 and closed the investigative record. On June 30, 2011, the Secretary of Energy responded by affirming the importance of a robust safety culture. Of course, they'll affirm everything, but I can affirm stuff all day long and actually you know, knowing the path and walking the path as Morpheus tells us are two different things. He says he affirms the importance of a robust safety culture and identifying several near-term actions to improve the safety culture on the project and to evaluate safety culture at other sites and projects. However, the Secretary's response rebutted some of the Board's findings. The Board provided additional detail to the Secretary in a letter and so on and so forth. And I, I captured this one to, again, foot dragging. They're, they, they're rebutting some of the Board's findings. What I find the Board, if anything, may be a little bit lenient. Right? They could be even more harsh, in my opinion, because I would right now be hammering on just closing the stuff down. But if it must be open at this point, we can be as harsh as we can with safety. You cannot be too safe with nuclear power. Okay? You can't be too safe with nuclear power. Recommendation 2000-1, prioritizing for stabilizing nuclear materials. The board issued recommendation 2000-1 as a follow-up to recommendation 94-1. I mean, again, a lot of acronyms and little numbers and stuff. Don't worry about that. The main need of it is you understand that the culture of safety within these contractors and the DOE is shot. It is shot in Bechtel and these other corporations. They're just out and out abusing this privilege they have of working for the American people. See, they forget that. They have completely forgot we own this country. The American people own this country. They don't own it. They are servants. They are public servants to us. They are to serve us. It's supposed to be a represent, representational democracy where I hire a guy or elect a guy to go and to speak for me. He's really only speaking for me on my behalf. He has the power. The people are supposed to have the power. But that has been perverted and subverted. And while they'll call us subversives, right, they're actually subverting the Constitution and subverting the actual what can I say, the essence of America. It's not what it used to be anymore, right? The Pete Santilli show saying that. And he's right. Okay, so they're issuing these recommendations, and don't let the numbers confuse you. It identifies the need to remediate large amounts of nuclear materials and liquid and solid form that remained in the manufacturing pipeline at the end of the Cold War. We're still cleaning up from the Cold War. Do you guys have any clue how long we're we'll going to be complete cleaning up from the Fukushima and the stuff? for just today's operations alone. This is a travesty, our kids. They are going to hate us, I promise you that. They are going to look back and say, why didn't you, why didn't you, why didn't you? And I'm proud to say myself and a handful of other people will be on record for having done the right thing and gotten nothing for it but a hard time from the authorities and their electronic surveillance and harassment and ringing of ears and hanging up on phone and that kind of stuff. It's pretty sad, folks, and I have, to, I have to say these things because you need to know what's happening to us researchers as we're trying to get this information out. Personally, no one's come up to me to threaten me myself, but I'm six foot seven. Even with a bad back, they're not going to have a good time, okay, just like on South Park. You're not going to have a good time when you try that with me. 
but they can hang up on my phone, they can make my ears ring, and other people, they can actually go and harass them, right? And this is this seems to be a, a regular thing with researchers who are trying to expose the nuclear industry. Go back to the movie Silkwood if you haven't seen it yet. It's an excellent movie. The acting is on spot. The lines are perfect. The, everything is very well done in that movie, and it really does, in a fair sense, show you both sides. It shows you the people, the nuclear plant and, and their position, and, and Jack Lemmon, I think, plays the operator that has to make the split-second decision, and they vent stuff into the atmosphere or whatever. But you see he's in a bit of a bind himself, and then you see on the other end the, the people that are trying to expose it, you see from their point of view. So it's an excellent movie all the way around. There's a whole big thing to nuclear power. It's, it's, people just have no clue. They really are just incredible. And I myself am still extremely ignorant as to all of the details. I'm still... What, a year into this February, I started writing about nuclear power. So prior to that, I just thought it was like everybody else, a wonderful way to produce electricity. Don't ever think about it. There's nothing to worry about it. In this recommendation, the board sought to reestablish the priority for stabilizing the materials that remained after six years of effort to implement the original recommendation. So it's sitting there and in no hurry to do anything about it. Foot dragging, again. The board noted that Savannah Riverside, Hanford, Rocky Flats, and Los Alamos National Laboratory possessed most of the legacy materials that were significantly behind schedule for remediation. As of 2011, a tremendous amount of material has been stabilized, and the greatest hazards have been remedied. Well, there's some good news. The only commitments remaining involve spent fuel sludge at Hanford and plutonium at Los Alamos National Laboratory. However, these commitments are years overdue with respect to the completion dates listed in DOE's implementation plan. The board is working with DOE to obtain an updated plan that accurately reflects expected completion dates for the remaining stabilization activities. Foot dragging, they're in no hurry, and this is darn serious stuff. I would take every measure to make sure with the utmost haste, while still operating in a safe mode, you have the utmost haste to get these things done. And to me that doesn't mean you're sprinting back and forth with a container of plutonium and you're going to have a tripping man accident, as they call them in this document, right? But that means reasonably, with the best speed you can without endangering yourself, we need to be solving these problems with the nuclear waste. We need to be systematically shutting the plants down and releasing the suppressed energy. And if I have time before I go tonight, I'll read that little clip from you guys from the Wilcox book where he talks about the over 5,000 patents that are being suppressed. Recommendation 2004-1, Oversight of Complex High Hazard Nuclear Operations. The board issued Recommendation 2004-1 to ensure that changes to DOE's organizational structure and practices were done form formally and deliberatively with due attention to unintended safety consequences that could reduce the safety of defense nuclear facilities. The recommendation had its origins in the board's belief that DOE should benefit from lessons learned in the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster and the corroded reactor vessel at the davis Bessie nuclear power plant. This belief has been heightened today by the Fukushima reactor accident and the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. The recommendations reinforce DOE's basic safety strategy as embodied in the core functions and guiding principles of integrated safety management. So it's only re reinforcing what they already have, but again, to note here, they're specifically talking about the organizational structure. It's like if you're streamlining, if you're moving people out, if you're downsizing, if you've you got to be very careful. You can't just do that willy-nilly without careful forethought and pre-planning into doing it without causing an effect in some area or a lack of a presence somewhere. Maybe someone's needed somewhere. You're streamlining and moving somewhere else. You have to be very careful about it. Also interesting to note the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster was that a matter they downsized and their organizational structure wasn't as it should have been. The corroded reactor vessel at Davis Bessie Nuclear Power Plant. Some of these things, you again, you don't read about them. You don't hear about these things. If you don't dig into these Freedom of Information documents, you may never. Was just an article recently my mom, my mom was telling me about in a paper that talked about Hanford and really just played such a positive light on Hanford when the reality is it's, it's absolute. It's a mess there. And you'll, we'll, we'll see. We're going to get to all this tonight. It's just one after another. The majority of the commitments in the DOE implementation plan for recommendation 2004-1 have been completed. The remainder were due in 2009, but were not accomplished one time. One of the commitments was closed this year, 
but it is not clear when the others will be completed. Some previous improvements have degraded as a result of changes in DOE safety directives. It's approach to management oversight or reduced emphasis. So they're in no hurry to do all this stuff, and the, some previous improvements have degraded as a result of changes. So the stuff that they were making improvements on, and they're going backwards. They're backpedaling. This is nuclear power. Gosh, I can't just explain to people what, when you get radiation, you have cancer in your bones and your thyroid and your hair is falling out and your teeth falling out. Right? That's, that's a reality. And low-dose radiation, look, I'm going to get to the study that's coming out, or actually it's out now. I just have to read through it and familiarize myself. But it's about leukemia in cleanup workers at Chernobyl. And, yes, there's a link. Low-dose radiation to some of the cleanup workers. Over time, a lot of them got leukemia. So don't think you're going to get out of it because it's a low dose that they tell you. You don't want, it's like dog poop. You don't want any radiation on you. Just like dog poop, folks. Active Confinement Systems, Recommendation 2004-2. In the summer of 2010, DOE completed its evaluation of all defense nuclear facilities in accordance with the implementation plan for this recommendation. NNSA concluded that the plutonium facility at Los Alamos was its only facility requiring upgrades. DOE's Office of Environmental Management had an independent team study the results of the evaluations for its facilities and prioritize them according to their safety enhancement value and cost effectiveness. The team recommended that DOE initiate projects to modify or upgrade the active confinement ventilation systems in selected facilities at Savannah River and Hanford in order to meet the performance criteria established in the DOE guide prepared for this purpose. In a letter dated October 1, 2010, DOE committed to make these upgrades and briefed the board within one year on the progress made in enhancing the reliability of those systems. In 2011, contractors at the Savannah River site evaluated the proposed modifications in more detail and concluded that different modifications to their ventilation systems would be more cost effective. The results of these evaluations have yet to be released formally to the board. So they've gone back and said, well, that's nice what you said, but our contractors looked at it and their proposed modifications that are going to be a lot cheaper. They're going to be cost effective. <laughs> Who cares about safety? This is cheap, on the fly cheap. And they won't even give it to the board. You would immediately say, hey, here's what we got, an alternative. Check it out. But instead, they're coveting and holding on to it. Look, they're not sharing information. This is not a culture of safety. Absolutely right. What an excellent analysis by the board. The board continued reviewing the design of new facilities, such as the uranium processing facility at Y12, that's Y-12, Y and the chemistry and metallurgy research replacement facility at Los Alamos to confirm that an active confinement system remains in the design of those facilities. The board believes that active confinement systems are critically important in facilities like Los Alamos plutonium facility because such systems prevent the release of radioactive materials and accidents. As part of the implementation plan, DOE committed to revise its directives to ensure that active confinement systems are the preferred option in designing new facilities. DOE is currently revising the pertinent directives to implement this commitment. You know, when I read some of the stuff, I think well, this is something they should be doing anyway, first and foremost. They're going to revise the pertinent directives to implement this commitment. They should be committed to this stuff to begin with. If it's critically important as some kind of containment system, like I say, you, if you're going to have nuclear, we have no choice. You just have to go overboard with safety. It's above and beyond the call of duty. No one should look at you and say, hey, it's a, we're tired of hearing about your, the problem. No, the exact opposite. Please, we welcome your, your input. We welcome, we have a suggestion box, and we take it seriously, right? You used to have that at the junkyard, a suggestion box. I mean, they would fill it with things about you should buy us a case of beer after work, but I would actually put the suggestions in there, and they didn't necessarily follow through with them either because, again, it's a, the salvage industry. It's, it's corporate. There's no difference. Okay, let's see the next clip. Los Alamos National Laboratory Plutonium Facility Seismic Safety. The board issued recommendation 2009-2 on October 26, 2009 to reduce the risk posed by an earthquake and subsequent fire at the Los Alamos Plutonium Facility. The secretary submitted an, an implementation plan for the recommendation on July 13, 2010. The laboratory took several immediate steps to reduce risk. This included reducing the quantity of material at risk in the facility now, where does it go? I mean, what do you do with it? It's going somewhere, though. You're moving it somewhere else. I mean, we need to be clear on some of this. Again, some of these boards are not as critical as they, sh they should be, and they need to go into that. If you just move it to another facility, 
where he says less risk, that's fine. That's a temporary treatment of the symptom. It's not solving the underlying problem, which is we're continuing to produce this waste material just as fast as we can, and we have no real simple, easy solution to make it go away. Oh, that we could send it into an interdimensional vortex, into another parallel dimension, and give it to those people, right? We can't do that, even if we were wanted to send it somewhere else where it doesn't belong. So this included reducing the quantity of material at risk in the facility. That's nice, but that's just a temporary thing. Instituting new controls on combustible materials and heat sources. Installing robust safes to more safely store material. A safe, that's like a gun safe to put the, something to contain it in. And installing automatic shutdown switches to de-energize equipment upon detection of an earthquake to reduce the likelihood of a fire. Wow, so all this stuff needs to be done. There's so much work to be done. They say, we're going to learn from this. They've had chances since when was the first reactor built. And those were crude, yes, but since the 80s and the 90s and the, now Fukushima. No, it's, just, it's not going to work. It just won't. And they're not doing the minimum things they can to give us the minimum amount of safety, it seems like to me. Again, all, installing automatic shutdown switches to de-energize equipment, bond detection, earth, that should be there now. You shouldn't have built it without it. As soon as you realize that needed to be there, you need to have made every effort to have it installed and tested and checked for safety, quality control, and then put online. It's that simple. The implementation plan committed to complete a more detailed earthquake analysis using the most recent information about possible earthquakes at the site. Los Alamos analysts completed this effort for PF4 in May 2011. They identified nine ways in which the PF4 structure could fail and release radioactive materials during an earthquake. Most importantly, they identified a weakness in the roof that could result in collapse of the building. As a result, the laboratory instituted compensatory measures and established a method to isolate leak paths to the environment that could result from failure of components inside the facility. In October 2011, the laboratory completed installation of a reinforcing beam on the roof intended to prevent the collapse of the facility in an earthquake. However, further analysis must be completed to determine whether the current structure of the facility can survive an earthquake. So, they, you know, again, it was awful risky to me and anyone with any common sense. You, you know, if this is what fascism brings, I'd tell you it's the most horrible thing on the planet I've ever seen. It really is because the merging of the government and the industry, that's like the only laws apply to the little peasants. And there's no laws for anyone else. Well, they'll pay a small fine. You know, BP will pay a fine, or some will pay a fine, but their profit margin and how much they make in a year, that's nothing. A pharmaceutical company can put a, a untested, largely untested drug out. People will die from it, and all they have to do is pay off a few lawsuits here and there. How much money are they making, right? Well, if they're still making money, they won't pull it. They'll pay the lawsuits and make the money. This is insane. Watch the movie Fight Club. It was very well exposing this little principle. On December 17, 2010, I uh, just read that, right? Advised implementation may be required. During this interim period, UAE continued testing. No, wait a minute. Make sure I read this. The recommendation focused on the need for large-scale testing to demonstrate the performance of mixing and transfer systems using representative stimulants. So, so it's something that's simulating what would actually really be used. They're going to test something first to, to guarantee the performance of mixing a later substance, which is the critical dangerous substance, but you have a similar one to test your machine or your device to make sure it's actually functioning before you put the really dangerous stuff in it, right? DOE submitted its implementation plan on November 10, 2011, and the board accepted it on January 19, 2012. During this interim period, DOE continued testing and obtained results inconsistent with an important assumption in the implementation plan. The revised implementation plan may be required. So during that interim period, they continued testing and obtaining results that are inconsistent. And we'll see later that there was a report that they knew about that they ignored, and they continued to use a faulty methodology to do their equations and come up with their, their data and their answers. So there's so much to, to when, when you really turn your eye, and probably nuclear power plants as well, not just these weapons facilities, but if you look at any NPP anywhere, uh, Crystal River or Turkey Point or uh, Nine Mile Oyster, any of these, got an Ofrate, uh, Diablo, there's so many that there's little things going on all the time. You just have to pay attention and watch, and you'll see it's constant, 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 constant. And when is there going to be a big one, bigger than three miles this next time? You know, when, is, when are we going to have a Fukushima over here? It is a question of when. It's absolutely a question of when. They're, making, they're relicensing plants that are so old now they're past their original period of time that they said, hey, you can run this plant safely, 
It's like you build an engine for a car for the mechanics out there, right? You rebuild your Chevy 350 engine, you break it in a, a period of warming up in a certain number of miles, the engine's broken, and the manual says, look, at 120,000 miles, you need to put new rings in it, pull the pistons out, rebuild all this, have the block checked for cracks, have the heads redone, all this kind of stuff, right? And do the same with nuclear power plant, only it's a little different with them, but initially they say, look, you're licensed for 40 years. After that, yeah, this isn't like a car where if the engine explodes, you leak an oil, you coast off the road. When this thing melts down, you have this ejection of particles into the atmosphere, and people get radiated, right? And it's a very dangerous situation, nothing to be taken lightly at all. We have alternative technologies that are being suppressed. We're going to talk about that for the end of the show. One implementation plan, deliverable, remains open. Some glove boxes contain high temperature equipment that could topple over in an earthquake and start a fire. There's your definition for the glove box, so I don't know exactly what this thing is, but we, we know enough about it right now to know it's a safety issue that's not being addressed. Again, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have four years of college. In fact, four years of college just means you got brainwashed and you're thinking inside the box. I would go for almost two years, almost get that AA degree, and then when your teacher tells you, that she doesn't carry a switchblade in a bra anymore because it nearly fell out and poked a hole in her foot, and now she keeps a gun in her purse, that's a good time to quit going to school and just start studying on your own. And then you're a free thinker, and you're learning what you want when you want. It's about not your schooling so much as your education, right? Anyone can get schooled, and we've been schooled since we, we've been born and able to accept information. Your parents are inputting to you. Your religion's inputting to you. Your school's inputting. Your government, Hollywood entertainment, and movies is giving you ideas. And that's not coming from you. That's coming from somebody else before you got here. So question and think critically. That's it's critical. And you don't again. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be an expert in physics. You don't have to be an expert in math. But what you do need, what you do need, is called common sense and a sense of fair play, right? If you got those things as opposed to quote unquote experience these days, that's even more critical. I would replace everyone in Congress who has experience with a guy off the street somewhere who just had common sense and was going to be fair. He could learn on the fly, and he would immediately make decisions based with a more of a moral guidance, with a moral compass, because he's a sense of fair play. He doesn't have connections. He doesn't have people he's got to hook up. If people don't know him, he doesn't know people, not to that degree in any case. So we have real problems, but there's solutions and ways to get around it. The system's broken to a large degree, but small components are still functioning. We need to exploit those and repair the damage uh, particulars. And if we just went back to the Constitution, we'd be doing all right. Okay, so glove boxes are something that is a safety issue. If they topple over, they have high temperature equipment, could start a fire. We hear about fires at nuclear power plants all the time. Okay, some of them go on for long periods of time. And not just a five or ten minute fire. They have very serious uh, warnings, but eventually they're put out, obviously. But it's commonplace. It's not uncommon. So we have a lot of safety issues clear that are not being addressed to the degree that the American public deserves. We're taxpayers. We're splitting the bills for all this. Why is it not safe? That's really simple. These glove boxes are expected to begin in 2012, upgrades in 2012. Also, a project execution plan that outlines in greater detail the strategy to upgrade important facility safety systems. So they, they need an execution plan. It seems to me like you're just totally discombobulated. Who's running the show down there? What? Again, if you don't hold people accountable, they, and, and if you have this frigid safety culture, they don't want to participate. They're not, you're not going to get out of your employees what you should. The system is in, it's fractured at that point, and we, we need to make repairs. I'm going to the next clip. That's pretty much what I wanted to show you there. A lack of clarity in DOE directives. This is the recommendation 2010-1, safety analysis requirements for defining adequate protection for the public and Workers again, we got to define adequate protection, right? Because they're 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 oh, what's the word for it? They're slimy, they're slithery. They can't hold them down. It's like a grease pig. Hey, we just want you to do the right thing, but it's like you have to almost twist their arm behind their back to make them do it. For this reason, the board sent a uh, uh, wait a minute, a lack of clarity in DOE directives and standards for nuclear facility safety analysis played a major role in the need for Recommendation 2009-2. For this reason, the board sent a letter to DOE on March 15, 2010, seeking DOE's interpretation of its standards for providing adequate protection of the public and the workers. DOE's response dated June 10, 2010, 
was not clear, giving the impression that the applicable DOE standard is open to interpretation. Well, again, this is like when you say an em a national emergency, what for continuity of government, for that kind of stuff. They, they word it very loosely. Okay, their, their lawyers, John Wu, whoever is going to come in and say, well, it's not torture, really. Waterboarding is not torture, right? And so it's, it's open to interpretation. When you leave it open to interpret it, they will abuse it. Not occasionally, every time. Every time. Every time. So they've left it open to interpretation. That's not good enough, though. Since adequate protection of the public and workers can only be ensured by strict compliance with a specific set of nuclear safety requirements, you can't just swing it, you can't go Indiana Jones style and wing it as you go along, the board concluded that some DOE standards have to be revised to clarify what constitutes adequate protection. I mean, what my opinion is and what their opinion is is two different things. I don't want any radiation on me, so I want to be adequately protected where none lands on me, right? It's not my deal. I don't want it. don't want anything to do with it. Well, why am I? It's like if a guy can't smoke a cigarette next to me in a restaurant, but a nuclear power plant can have an effluent discharge that they claim is below a certain, always below a certain point, right? You get this, folks. It's just an incredible hypocrisy of America. And we're, we pay taxes for something. Some of them are going to remind me what we pay taxes for one day. Since adequate protection of the public and workers can only be ensured by strict compliance with a specific set of nuclear safety requirements, the board concluded that some DOE standards have to be revised to clarify what constitutes adequate protection. The board issued Recommendation 2010-1 to ensure that DOE defines a clear and unambiguous and ambiguous set of nuclear safety requirements. DOE partially accepted the recommendation on February 28, 2011. DOE rejected the portion of the recommendation related to existing defense nuclear facilities where an accident could cause off-site doses exceeding well-established safety criteria. So they rejected the recommendation relating to existing defense nuclear facilities where an accident could cause off-site doses exceeding the 25 rand or whatever it was we were just talking about. But again, DO, you know, I've been clear about this. NRC, I'm not big fans of, not at all. But there's some good players in there that have tried to a, to a certain degree. DOE is much worse. And that's why you hear these things about NRC in the FOIA documents about, oh, they're going to send a contingent of uh, DOE guys down here. And the guy's like, no, 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 because we'll have to send a contingent of wranglers to, to wrangle them in. And we know that. We know how bad DOE is, right? It's clear in the documents, right? DOE stated that the responsible program secretarial officer had evaluated the safety measures taken or planned for those facilities and concluded they were adequate. DOE also stated that it would consider the board's recommendations regarding specific changes to safety requirements, but that further analysis was needed to determine that exact, the exact changes to make. DOE also committed to refine the requirements and standards that govern federal approval authority including processing criteria for those instances where the established safety, safety criteria are not met. DOE is scheduled to submit the first of the revised safety standards for that board's review in April 2012. Again, they don't seem to be too concerned about off-site doses. And to me, it boggles my mind why anyone, they must be completely ignorant when you get a job at the nuclear power plant. You just, you must not know the whole history of, you know, it's like working with asbestos. Maybe you just didn't know when you got the job, and then later you find out about, oh, crap, I got a job at asbestos, and it, it gets people sick. That's not cool. Maybe they just don't know, because to me right now, if you said, hey, I got a job at the nuclear power plant, it's uh, 60000 a year to start, I would tell you to get lost. I think I'm happy having nothing and, and being healthy and not having cancer so far, to be honest with you. you take any chance that the darn thing melts down on during your term of employment. Okay, next clip is the number 20, emergency preparedness, response, and recovery. Nuclear facilities of all kinds, civilian and defense. This is the board giving a little overview here. Nuclear facilities of all kinds, civilian and defense, are designed with safety systems to prevent accidents. Should an accident occur, a second set of systems is intended to prevent the release of radioactive materials into the environment. Experiences such as the accidents at Three Mile Island in 1979 and Fukushima in 2011 have shown, however, the prudence of a third layer of safety measures known as emergency planning and preparedness. In other words, when the other two don't work, you better have a third contingency about what you're going to do. These measures are premised on the possibility that a release of radioactive material could occur in spite of all the engineers' safety systems 
and confinement barriers provided to nuclear facilities. So we know, and that's based on obvious historical fact, that they have countermeasures and safety measures and all that, but we've had a number of incidences now culminating in Fukushima, the world's largest industrial disaster to date of the worst proportions its nuclear. BP spill was bad, maybe even stop the Gulf Stream, which will affect the climate in Europe, is what my research has led me to believe. But in Fukushima, it's a thousand, ten thousand fold in my opinion. It's much worse than Chernobyl than they're letting you on to know. And the releases have been much more vast than they're actually letting on to us. Because it's more than just iodine and cesium. There's krypton, there's the uh the uh what's the oh gosh, it starts with an X. And the gas xenon, radioactive xenon, radioactive xenon gas. There's so much stuff it'll boggle your mind, folks. So it's why can't we just have solar panels, solar power? Seriously. Well, xenon gas went all over the place. I saw NILU models that were pretty scary. And, and when I looked into xenon gas, we just haven't studied a lot about what the effects are. So they'll tell you off the bat nothing to worry about. But again, they also admit sufficient tests and studies haven't been done to see really what the effects of it will be. And then the initial plume in a couple weeks, of, you know, a month afterwards of Fukushima, those models were very intense because it just showed that North America was inundated with this radioactive gas, xenon. It's not natural to breathe in those quantities. That I'm absolutely sure of. At the same time, you're getting a dose of a little bit of everything. It's more than just the iodine, cesium, and there's plutonium, there's uranium involved, maybe in small forms, and a lot of other things as well released. And quite a, so many, I, I can't list them here tonight. I do need to make a list, though, and rattle it off one night to just see the wide range. Not all of them last for very long. Some of the half-lives are very short. Some of the stuff is just there for a little while, and it's gone. But other stuff stays, you know, as we well know, thousands and thousands of years. Emergency preparedness, response, and recovery have been areas of emphasis for the board. The board is particularly interested in improving DOE's preparedness to respond to low-probability, high-consequence accidents. In other words, it's not... Likely it's going to happen, but if this accident happens, it's like a big one that would be a, an earthquake in a snowstorm in a blizzard, you know, the, a double whammy, if, we'll, if you like calling it that. Although such accidents are unlikely, DOE must be prepared for them. Again, it's just contingency plans. And I, in the military, they do this. They're, they they try to prepare for all contingencies. But why not in the DOE? Why not in the nuclear power industry? This is insane because it seems like on the battlefield they try to prepare for that, but when it comes to the weapons and the contractors and that whole business, it's very uh, a slipshod, lackadaisical type performance. Although such accidents are unlikely, DOE must be prepared for them. Major natural disasters, major natural disasters can affect multiple facilities simultaneously. Destroy the infrastructure needed to reach or evacuate the site of the accident, damage emergency response equipment, and result in conflicting needs for emergency response for defense, nuclear facilities, and the local community. Again, that's just keeping it real. That's just keeping it as real as real can be. Because we're on planet Earth, we're flying through space, how many thousands of miles an hour, orbiting around the sun, there's meteors flying around. <laughs> I mean, come on, with the geological process rendered going here, the Earth is not stable. To me, it's just sheer madness to even begin on the nuclear power plant trek. I would have never taken the first step. The board has focused its attention on one, DOE's ability to respond to natural disasters that can affect multiple facilities at a site. Again, like Sandy coming in, we well know we had multiple emergencies at, top, at nuclear power plants when Sandy came in. It's not a weapons facility per se, but we know the NPPs, they are affected by these massive weather systems, especially when our own rogue government is engineering said weather system, and that's historically been proven since 1960. ChemtrailsPlanet.net. ChemtrailsPlanet.net. Go there and please read that article here. It's, got a, it's one of the best. Two, cascading events such as an earthquake that starts a wildland fire or an earthquake that causes flooding by collapsing dams. Again, I've got a video up on my YouTube channel. I type in Fort Calhoun or Fort Cooper, and you'll come back a video where I had uh, a low, very low frequency returns on and telecast or another one of these servers and I was able to show they, they created this storm line and brought it right in on these nuclear power plants. At the same time, for the last six to eight weeks, they've been causing flooding all around the dams, and that would be the mid-north, kind of mid-northwest region, 
and they've been flooding that area heavily. In fact, the Army Corps was out there. That's when a dam mysteriously broke, and, or uh, it was a, not a dam, but one of the things that the Katrina, the, uh, the levee, one of the levees they had or some kind of berm they had built up accidentally, accidentally broke and it flooded. People had to be, remember, a lot of people had to be moved. This is huge weather systems being engineered. And again, it plays into this weird thing where it, it, I have actually documented this now twice myself. Okay, the first one was Fort Calhoun and the second one was with Sandy when it came up and smacked Oyster Creek and Nine Mile and all these others up there. And this is very worrisome to me because I can only conclude, that, and I don't know why, you know, it's like a detective watching a guy commit a crime and he stabs someone and runs off. You don't know why he stabbed him. You just see that it's happening and, you, you know, you have to act on it. You don't necessarily need to know why they're doing it, but something needs to be done. Now, I'm going to continue to hammer home on this because I am very fearful of some type of criticality over here. And if it happens by an engineered weather system, right, that to me is one of the most, crazy things of all, that someone is intentionally trying to do this. Now, if you go back to T.E. Bearden, who's a researcher, and he's got a video on YouTube, T.E. Bearden will tell you that the Soviets were doing electromagnetic engineering over the United States back in the 80s, changing our jet stream, you know, playing around with us over here. They mastered it long before we did. So I can't, you know, I don't know the whole big picture, but I can tell you this for certain. It's very worrisome when you see the plane spray it and you see the signatures, and then it goes right to my triple saw blade signature, and that's where the hurricane makes landfall. And I predicted with 100% accuracy, I'm scratching my head saying, this is insane, but it's really, really, really happening. So please take it very seriously. I am going to do a thing on the climate modification weather control soon and how that ties in with the nuclear power plants in there, you know, you know, this new world order takeover. It's very real, as you'll see in these little step-by-steps -step as they, they move forward and move forward. And there's no move forward to shut down any nuclear power plants. Like the same normal logical things that should be done aren't being done. But instead, executive orders to, to take uh, military control in the event of a disaster, these steps are being taken, right? No steps are being taken really to make us safe. In fact, FEMA stands down. DHS won't warn us about the plume. Uh, the EPA downplays the RADNET monitors, fiddles with them. You see there's no attempt at all to ensure our safety. But, but. On the other hand, there's every uh, effort being made to exact the executive orders. And I posted a reblog one today or did a video today on this, on these executive orders that lead to the FEMA camps. You can clearly see step by step they are preparing for some giant accident. Now, whether it's a false flag, they want to pop a nuclear plant over here, is my opinion they're looking for any excuse to have a martial law crackdown. A nuclear power plant meltdown over here would certainly if it was a, even a Chernobyl level, would certainly fit that bill to some degree. And if you had a Fukushima-type event or power grid or grid plural go out, that's going to be a very serious situation. Very, and this is, they're not telling you this on the big picture. You can hear about Fukushima, and the, but they're, well, the danger factor here in America right now, Fukushima will fall out of sight. There's ticking time bombs, plural. I mean, one's in Diablo, the place that called Diablo Canyon, and it's on a fault line. You know, that's how bad it is. That's, that's a perfect example. It's called Diablo Canyon. They might as well call it Nuclear Meltdown Canyon, if you ask me. All right. I don't mean to get distracted, but seriously, at some point, it just becomes so much. I have to, it's like blowing off steam and relieving stress because you realize just how serious it is. I mean, one of these blows over here, people immediately will be affected. They don't even have a means to get out and inform everybody. If you look at the Comanche Point Emergency Preparedness Plan, well, well, then public is not, is not going to automatically, an alarm's not going to ring. They don't come to your house and install an alarm and say, you're within a 50-mile evacuation zone. We're installing an alarm. A light will flash red and a siren will sound in the event of a nuclear emergency. It's not like that. You'll be lucky to have your phone give you some kind of message if you sign into some program or something like that. Maybe your county or your mayor is concerned and has some disaster preparedness program, but otherwise I've read that they send the sheriff out in some cases to let you know. Maybe he gets you, maybe he hauls ass if the meltdown's too severe in Fukushima, let me tell you. They were refusing to go up there. They really were. People don't want to hang out when a nuclear plant melts down. So, where was I? The earthquake causes flooding by collapsing dams. Gosh. The impacts of the loss of utilities and supporting infrastructure on DOE's ability to respond to disasters. See how many things that can happen in a cascading event, an earthquake that causes a wildland fire, 
an earthquake, followed by a tsunami, you know, the impacts of the loss of utilities and supporting infrastructure. Let's say you have your diesel uh, generators and your fuel and your batteries and your pumps, and they're staged and ready in case there's an emergency. And indeed, there's a nuclear, uh, um, uh, there's an earthquake, and the result is a fire at the nuclear plant, and it spreads to your warehouse and this stuff, and it catches on fire, and boom, it burns down. Or let's say the earthquake itself just rattles it and damages it. That's a problem in and of itself. So one of the NTTF recommendations was stage your stuff off-site in a safe spot. Maybe even stage equipment there that in case it's not damaged, you have it close by where you can deploy it quickly and easily. But in the event it's much more serious, it's a cascading event or a multiple unit meltdown, you have a backup plans and backup plans for your backup plans, right? That's how it's got to be with nuclear. And really, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. And we're not going to learn from these lessons. We're only going to kill more people and make the cancer industry grow even to a larger monstrosity than it is now. In general, the board has found that emergency preparedness programs at defense nuclear facilities vary in effectiveness. Improvements have been made periodically in response to reviews by DOE and the board, but such improvements are not always consistently maintained over the long term. An effective emergency preparedness program must be maintained at a high level of readiness and regularly tested by drills. I couldn't agree more. Otherwise, it does not perform its intended function as an element of defense in depth. The board received testimony on emergency preparedness in its 2011 public hearings at the Savannah River site and the Los Alamos National Laboratory. In a letter to the NNSA administrator dated August 19, 2011, the board questioned the effectiveness of emergency preparedness at the Savannah River site as a safety measure for the tritium facilities. We know Savannah is one of the most polluted sites there is. Look into that one because it's bad. NNSA responded to this letter on November 14, 2011. And in its response, NNSA committed to a more extensive and realistic. They always commit to more of this and say they're going to do this. But again, this board's been around forever. This isn't the first report to Congress. And it's not the first negative report to Congress. I can promise you that. And so it seems to me we're just cyclical in nature, pointing a finger and saying, you need to do this, you need to do this, but is it being done? Is it being done? By and large, the answer is going to be no. Seismic safety, the Los Alamos plutonium facility. The plutonium facility at Los Alamos National Laboratory plays a unique role in supporting NNSA's mission. It was chosen as a long-term location for NNSA's plutonium processing, purification, and component fabrication. Of the many accident scenarios that could affect PS4, earthquakes have always been a particular concern because they have the potential to affect all materials stored in the building and to cause large releases and large doses to the public. The potential for earthquakes at each of NNSA sites is required to be reevaluated periodically. In May 2007, the laboratory contractor published an updated analysis that highlighted a significant increase in the potential earthquake activity of the site. A significant increase, increase in the possible vertical ground motion was of particular concern. The contractor initiated detailed analysis of several facilities, including PS4, to determine the safety implications of this information. In December 2008, NNSA approved a major revision to PS4 safety basis. This analysis did not account for the increased earthquake hazard that was still being evaluated by the laboratory. Nonetheless, the accident presenting the highest off-site consequence was an earthquake followed by a large facility fire. Critical safety systems needed to protect workers and the public, including the fire suppression system and the confinement ventilation system, are not expected to survive a large earthquake. Now, I'll read that again. Critical safety systems needed to protect workers and the public, including the fire suppression system and the confinement Ventilation system are not expected to survive a large earthquake. Again, Greg Pallas writes a lot about this kind of stuff where the contractors are cutting corners. As a result, the board issued recommendation 2009-2, Los Alamos National Laboratory Plutonium Facility Seismic Safety, which sought actions by DOE to protect the public from the consequences of a large earthquake at PF4, Plutonium Facility 4. More details about this recommendation can be found earlier in this annual report. Contractor personnel at the laboratory completed the new seismic analysis for PF4 in May 2011. They identified nine ways in which the PF4 structure could fail and release radioactive materials during an earthquake. 
The most important finding identified a weakness in the roof that could result in the collapse of the roof. And I believe we read earlier where they went in and uh, braced up something, made a, a modification to the roof, but they still said we still aren't sure if this is going to be safe in an earthquake. Again, very chancy taking chances where we should not be taking any chances at all. One child shouldn't get cancer from nuclear power, not a single one. Laboratory personnel took several actions to reduce the risk posed by these vulnerabilities. They instituted compensatory measures to limit, limit the material at risk in PF4 and restrict access to vulnerable areas. In other words, keep the amount of material to a minimum and don't store any excess material there. That's logical and intelligent. Restrict access to vulnerable areas and establish a method to isolate leak paths to the environment that could result from failure of components inside the facility. In October 2011, the laboratory contractor completed installation of a reinforcing beam on the roof, we just talked about that, intended to prevent the collapse of the facility from the failure of the roof girders in an earthquake. The board remains concerned about the safety at PF4. Again, real quick, back to Fukushima, that's really fine. The roofs on these things just caved in and fell in on the spent fuel pool. So it's a very poor design on the old Mark I. If any of these were the spent fuel pool is stored above the reactor, that's just absolutely insane. And it's to conserve space and con to serve, conserve material. I've studied the Mark I containment system and the complaints on the reason it's so problematic is they're cutting the corners and material to save money and have the cheapest design they can. Well, you make a robust design, you spend extra money, you go overboard because it's so dangerous if something happens. Maybe the first few you didn't know. But how long, again, I say the learning curve, it's, it's a flat line, obviously it's a flat line. The board remains concerned about safety at PF4, as many of the questions regarding the building's response to a major earthquake are yet unanswered. This is incredible. We'll just take a chance. No hurry. No, it's not like there's earthquakes happening all over the place right now. Oh, man. Uh, that's pretty what I want to read you there. I want to, well, here at the bottom it says, says with a focus on earthquake safety in its, NNSA and contract engineers committed to provide information analysis regarding facility weakness that could lead to release of radioactive materials and high risk to the public. Again, you're going to see that phrasing there a lot. That's what the board is, is concerned about, these releases of radioactive materials and the high risk to the public. Y-12 conduct and operations and work planning. The Y-12 National Security Complex is essential to the safe, secure, and reliable management of the nuclear weapons stockpile. Operators at Y-12 receive and store enriched uranium and manufacture, disassemble, and inspect nuclear weapon components. The board provides safety oversight for these activities. Since 2007, contractor personnel at Y-12 have performed an annual assessment of the adequacy, adequacy of the aging 9212 complex to support, to support continued safe operations. Some infrastructure improvements have been made. During 2010, Contractor manager self-reported several operational events and weaknesses in the work planning and conduct of operations. In 2011, the board also documented instances of inadequacies in procedures and poorly implemented work processes. In a letter to NNSA dated August 25, 2011, the board identified several weaknesses related to the safe performance of work at Y-12. In particular, Workers lacked rigor during execution of procedures and work packages. In some instances, operators did not follow procedures as written, and poor procedure quality hindered the safe performance of work. In another letter to NNSA dated December 29, 2011, the board identified instances in which the site's work planning relied on generic hazards not covered this planned work activity. Consequently, the fundamental objectives of activity level work planning were not being met. In response to the board's concerns, contractor personnel developed corrective actions for the observed weaknesses. These actions include, one, requiring a more rigorous approach to executing procedures, two, developing hands-on training for workers, reinforced, three, augmenting and integrating oversight, blah, blah, blah. In other words, again, like I say, talk is cheap. They say we're going to do all this stuff, but in the end, why, do we, why is this culture so unsafe. That's what we have to ask ourselves. It's incredibly problematic. And nothing seems, no progress is being made into changing it. Mixing in process vessels. On December 17, 2010, the board issued recommendation 
2010-2, pulse jet mixing at the waste treatment and the mobilization plant. To address nuclear safety hazards arising from in, inadequate mixing of waste and processing tanks. DOE's initial response on February 10, 2011 was not a clear acceptance. Again, foot dragging. The board reaffirmed its recommendation and requested that the Secretary of Energy provide the board with a final decision on whether DOE would implement all or part of the recommendation. DOE notified the board on June 20, 2011 that it would accept the recommendation in its entirety. DOE provided the board with its implementation plan on November 10, 2011. The board evaluated the plan and concluded that it was adequate to solve the problem identified by the board. DOE plans to conduct a test program to determine the capabilities of the plant's mixing systems, develop waste acceptance criteria for the plant that will address safety concerns associated with mixing, and determine the requirements for waste sampling systems in the tank farms and the plant. Again, if they would just cooperate right off the bat and they want to question and foot drag on half the stuff and all is a delay because in the end it's all going to have to be done anyway. It's all found in logical and, and, and based in safe practices. Okay, here's a good one. Frame number 30. Use of low order accumulation model. In 2011, the board expressed its belief that a software model being used by the project contractor to assess the performance of mixing systems was not suitable for predicting the accumulation of solids in process vessels. The model will consistently underpredict the accumulation of solids and has no sound physical basis. DOE informed the board that the model will not be used for further design work. DOE's contractor is developing a revised approach to validating vessel design as a result of the board's findings. Hydrogen and piping in ancillary vessels. DOE's contractor continues to pursue using quantitative risk assessment to design piping in ancillary vessels that have the potential for hydrogen explosion. The contractor recently completed its resolution of technical concerns previously identified by the board and by an independent review team chartered by DOE. However, the contractor has not yet implemented the revised hydrogen control strategy in the plant's safety design or safety basis. It also needs to complete a major testing effort to determine the effect of hydrogen explosions on components such as valves and instrumentation. Spray leak analysis. In 2011, the board challenged the contractor's technical approach for determining the consequences of accidents involving sprays of radioactive liquids. DOE acknowledged that the board's concerns are valid and committed to resolve them through a test program. DOE anticipates receiving test results in early 2012. Aerosol deposition velocity. Deposition velocity is an important parameter used to calculate consequences of accidents that release radioactive material. The board determined that DOE's choice of a value for deposition velocity could not be technically justified. DOE agreed with the board's position. DOE's contractor is now using suitable values for this parameter. As a further result of the board's action, DOE has issued a revised policy on dep deposition velocity that is conservative and encourages the use of site-specific values. Heat transfer analysis for process vessels in the pretreatment facility. The board found that the contractor's heat transfer analysis do not support a change in safety requirements pertaining to hydrogen gas. DOE plans to better justify technical assumptions in the contractor's heat transfer model. So on this screen capture here, you get a great sample of just what's really going on as far as the foot drag and nothing's right, things that you would think would be just standard are, are not. It really seems to be a mess between the DOE and these contractors. And although the board seems to point it out to a fairly accurate degree, in the end it seems to be a lot of, a lot of hot air with it at the low activity waste facility. DOE committed to use alternative methods to reevaluate the reliability of these systems. The board believes the approach identified by DOE and its contractor to address this issue is acceptable. Ammonia hazards. The board found inadequate the design features proposed to protect workers from release of large quantities of ammonia stored at the plant. DOE stated that the contractor would reassess the design of these systems. Again, great example, just common sense stuff, it seems, is a total lack down there. And they'd have to come and say, hey, this is common sense. You're not protecting the released ammonia. And they're just, if, 
you know, this common sense stuff is not being done in this most critical format of nuclear power. There's no room for error when we're talking about radiation, not a solar panel. Transuranic waste remediation and disposal. The board reviewed transuranic waste remediation operations at DOE's Idaho and Savannah River sites and transuranic waste disposal at the waste isolation plant in New Mexico. Again, they're all over the place. The new board found procedural compliance issues at Idaho, leading DOE and its contractor to take corrective actions. The board also evaluated preparations for the retrieval of degraded waste boxes and drums at the Advanced Mixed Waste Treatment Project at Idaho. The board identified problems with the contractor's implementation of safety controls, which were corrected during pre-start activities for the retrieval work. At the Savannah River site, the board reviewed the startup of new phases of transuranic waste remediation operations in E area, F Canyon, and H Canyon. The board found that during F Canyon's preparations for operation, operators and shift operations managers did not understand topics such as safety basis requirements. They reconducted remedial training for the affected personnel. Again, they don't know the basics. They don't know the safety basis requirements that remedial training, look, again, if this would, would be one time, I would say it's nothing but a thing. But when it's consistently over time, over time, over time, these, these guys don't even know the basics of safety, how to operate the equipment, the procedure. It seems to me, again, a slipshod, very poorly run operation. Transuranic waste cleanup is becoming increasingly hazardous and challenging as the effort progresses. Many of the containers remaining to be addressed are in poor condition and contain much higher quantities of radioactive and hazardous materials than containers already processed. Greater worker protection will be required during cleanup. Incidents that resulted in plutonium uptakes by workers at Idaho and Savannah River serve as important lessons learned. Well, there's a hard, real example workers uh, of plutonium uptakes by workers, right? That doesn't sound good to me. The waste isolation pilot plant is the nation's sole facility for permanent disposal of defense-related transuranic waste. As a result of the board's efforts, DOE took actions in 2011 to improve the safety of these activities, as summarized below. The board evaluated reviews conducted by NNSA to affirm the line oversight and contractor assurance systems at the Y-12 National Security Complex in Tennessee and at the Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The board provided direct feedback on problems with the performance and logistics of these reviews to the affirmation team leaders. The board found that the review at Y-12 did not delve into sufficient detail to assess the effectiveness of either line oversight or the contractor assurance system, and that the review at Sandia was premature based on the contractor's own assessment that its implementation was incomplete. And an SA used this feedback to improve the affirmation review process to be applied to the remaining sites. A lot of times they're going to they say, yes, we're going to do this to, to improve this, we're going to do this to correct it. But again, I look at you and say, it, it's ongoing, these things that they're finding, one after another. Once they fix one or try to re, you know, remediate it, there's another problem. There's another uh, situation in another plan. The board's investigation focused on allegations raised by Dr. Thomas Seitz. Again, the strange and mysterious case of Dr. Thomas Seitz, a contractor employee removed from his position at WTP, a construction project in Washington State, funded by DOE and managed by Bechtel National Incorporated. The board's inquiry did not attempt to assess the validity of Dr. Thomas Titus' retaliation claim, but rather, as required by the board statute, examined whether his allegations of a failed safety culture at WTP, if proven true, might reveal events or practices adversely affecting safety in the design, construction, and operation of this defense nuclear facility. Next is just a screen capture of the Appendix A. And here we go. We're going to Secretary of Energy Notice, Nuclear Safety Policy issued on September 9, 1991, and superseding policy statement number two, policy statement number two of DOE, Department of Energy and Nuclear Safety Policy issued on February 8, 2011, saying that DOE is committed to establishing and maintaining a strong safety culture at its nuclear facility. The investigation's principal conclusion is that the prevailing safety culture at this project effectively defeat the secretarial mandate. Okay, the, the culture there is in total, um, it's not congruent with their mandate. It's the opposite. The investigative record demonstrates that both DOE and contractor project management behaviors 
reinforce project management behaviors, reinforce a subculture at WTP that deters the timely reporting and acknowledgement and ultimate resolution of technical safety concerns. Again, the management behaviors is getting the employees are thinking, hey, nah, I'm probably not going to report that because look what happened to Dr. Thomas Sidus. A key attribute of a healthy safety culture as identified by DOE's Energy Facility Contractors Group and endorsed by Deputy Secretary of Energy Mem Memorandum dated January 16, 2009, and in the NRC's proposed policy statement on safety culture, is that leaders demonstrate clear expectations and a commitment to safety in their decisions and behaviors. The board's investigation found significant failures by both DOE and contractor management to implement their roles as advocates for a strong safety culture. And we're almost about to Dr. Thomas Sidus. We're going to talk about what happened to him. We're going to squeeze this in. Finding one, chilled atmosphere adverse to safety exists. Dr. Walter Thomas Sidus, a former engineering manager at the Waste Treatment and Immobilization Plant, alleged that he was removed from the project because he identified certain technical issues that, in his view, could affect safety. Dr. Thomas Sidus also alleged that there was a failed safety culture at WTP. With full understanding that the formal claims of retaliation raised by Dr. Thomas Sidus would be looked into by others, the board decided that his assertions raised serious questions about safety culture and safety management at WTP. From late July 20 to May 2011, the board reviewed a large number of documents and interviewed a substantial number of persons, including Dr. Thomas Sidus, as to assess whether or not his allegations of safety issues and of a faulty safety culture were borne out. The board's investigation later expanded in scope to address matters related to the board's October 2010 public hearing at Hanford on safety issues at WTP. This phase of the investigation consisted of closed hearings at which sworn testimony was elicited from DOE and contractor personnel. Okay, good. We're going to get to this clip, and I'm going to end on this. And we'll, if I have to. I'll come back, but this might be right near the end. The board finds the expressions of technical dissent affecting safety at WTP, especially those affecting schedule or budget, were discouraged, if not opposed or rejected without review. Project management subtly, consistently, and effectively communicated to employees that differing professional opinions counter to decisions reached by management were not welcome and would not be dealt with on their merits. There is a firm belief among WTP project personnel that persisting in a dissenting argument can lead, as in the case of Dr. Thomas Sidus, to the employee being removed from the project or reassigned to other duties. As of the, as of the writing of this finding, Dr. Thomas Sidus sits in a basement cubicle in Richland with no meaningful work. Again, I'm going to repeat that because that just blew my mind. It's like the movie... Uh, uh, Oh, what's it called? Office or, or whatever it was, where the guy ends up in a cubicle in the basement, right? As of the writing of this finding, Dr. Thomas Sidus sits in a basement cubicle in Richmond with no meaningful work. They just put him down and he's been, he's been ostracized, right? They don't want nothing to do with him because he talked about safety. His isolated physical placement by contractor management and the lack of meaningful work is seen by many as a constant reminder of what management will do to an employee who raises issues that might impact budget or schedule. Other examples of the failed safety and culture include the board heard testimony from several witnesses that raising safety issues can add to project costs or delay schedule or hurt one's career and reduce one's participation on project teams. A high-ranking safety expert on the project testified that the expert felt next in line for removal after Dr. Thomas Sidus because of the expert's refusal to yield to technically unsound positions on matters affecting safety advanced by DOE and contractor managers responsible for design and construction at the WTP. The safety expert's opinion was validated by a senior DOE official in separate sworn testimony. Okay, we're going to continue this tomorrow night. I'll pick up from here, and I've got some other things I want to go over as well. I did want you to hear that last little bit about Dr. Thomas Sidus and about you know, his treatment when he stood up as a whistle, not really a whistleblower either. He's just talking about safety and trying to make suggestions and point out possible um, areas that are lacking in safety. And when he does that, he's dealt with rather harshly. And although he did the right thing, he went to the board and they're investigating and what have you, it doesn't matter because he's, he's punished for doing the right thing. And eventually he's, you know, he's relocated to a basement cubicle in Richland with no meaningful work. They just got him down there. He's being like, like wow, just, that to me is just so wrong on so many levels, right? So many levels. 
Okay, so this is a little bit of a uh, moving away from what I usually do in the theme of uh, these FOIA documents pertaining to plume gate and that initial plume and radioactive fall, but we will get back to that. I'm going to finish this up tomorrow night. I will read a letter from Robert Alvarez who, uh, who wrote in, and it's a very well-written letter that covers a lot of these problems as well. So join me. We'll pick up tomorrow night for about another 15, 20 minutes of this. Then we'll get back into some more plume gate documents, and we want to know who knew what and when they knew it, right? Okay, folks, this is Patrick Penry, and this is a long episode tonight, but we'll finish tomorrow and move on to other stuff. And I appreciate you joining me and taking interest and taking the time to get informed and involved because knowing the path and walking the path are two different things, folks. We're asking you guys to join us on Uncovering Plume Gate, dig in the documents, write about them, talk about them, and walk the path with us, okay? Patrick Penry, over and out.